Good morning. This is the recording of the worship service message for June the 19th, Sunday, June the 19th. And I want to get started by making a few shout outs to friends that I haven't seen in a while, but I know watch this recording and also uh, send us contributions from time to time as they can. Uh, shout out to Brett Barnes and his family. I look forward to having lunch with Brett pretty soon when most of the COVID stuff is gone and we can get together again. And to Janet Young, who is a shut-in and having had a terrific injury to her uh, right shoulder. And for uh, her quick recovery, I know they've moved her to another uh, section of another facility, but I hope to see her very soon. She's a prayer. She knows the Lord. She's been in a lot of misery. So we ask God to be kind to Janet Young. Also, it's good to see Tom and Carol Metzner last Sunday. Hadn't seen them in two years. Tom has very delicate lungs and uh, often gets uh, ill if he's around sick people. But God has miraculously preserved him through all of this mess that's been going on with COVID. She told me that they watch me each week on a 65-inch TV. Now, that's kind of scary to see me much larger than I truly am. I never wanted to be that large. But I'm grateful to them for their faithfulness and for their coming last Sunday to our church picnic. Also, remember to pray for Eliatris Wood. Eliatris had to make arrangements for her younger sister who died suddenly and without warning. She had to go to Texas to do it. She's back now, but all of that, uh, the details are not settled. And in every family, when someone dies suddenly, there is always mixed grief, mixed reactions, and sometimes they're not all good. So we pray that God will give her wisdom and love and a spirit of peace to know what to do and when to do it. <laughs> Patty Bovnar, one of our dearest members, most tender-hearted, sacrificial people has suffered greatly and now they're under quarantine again at her house because of some COVID exposure to them all. Also to the churning coughs, I miss you. I know you're hunkered down somewhere out by the lake or I assume you are and that you watch faithfully as well. Some of our great members, I look forward to when everything's back to normal or whatever the new normal is supposed to look like. Also for Regina and Alberta, who watched the service faithfully also. Two of my all-time favorite people. I love Regina and Alberta, her mother, and they're shut in also every day. Due to her advanced age, uh, Regina, Alberta's advanced age, and uh, Regina takes care of her. What a godsend. I hope if I live that long, my children will want to care for me too. So I appreciate what she's doing. And for Kelly Rendy and Don, his father, I don't see you as much as I'd like to. But may the peace of God rest on your house and rest in your spirit. Give you strength to do more than you ever thought you could do. Also for Juanita Bourne, a dear friend in Brandon, Mississippi, where my first church was. We've kept in touch for these 27 years. And Juanita's lymphoma has returned. So if when you're praying and you've had cancer and you know what it means to pray for those with cancer, pray for Juanita Bourne, a better friend no man ever had, and we love her and ask God to spare her life. Now, we move on to the facts of the service, and in the service we're going to be singing four hymns as usual. Hallelujah, what a Savior, also known as Man of Sorrows, what a grief, uh, what a, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Alleluia. What a Savior. Then we will sing another great tune with a strong melody. I sing the mighty power of God. Then we will later in the service sing Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness, a hymn which is hundreds of years old. And is the church, is, church in every, many continents has been singing this hymn for quite a while. And it deserves it. And then we'll close our service with the wonderful contemplative hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This, O My Soul, O My Soul. What Wondrous Love Is This, O My Soul. 
Our four scripture readings this morning are 1 Kings 19, 1 to 15a, Psalm 22, 19 to 28, Luke 8, 26 to 39, and then the text for the morning, from which I will draw my remarks, Hebrews 11, 24 to 28, and it reads like this. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. The name of this message is Making the Best Choice. Every time you make a choice for something, you by necessity choose to reject something else. Every choice you make every day involves two things. Refusal of one thing in order to embrace another thing. One of the reasons I really appreciate people coming to church is, in this day and age, they have so many other options. They can choose to do many things that are great fun or something more profitable, something financially ad ad uh, advantageous to them. We all, every day, make thousands of choices. And when we do, we are excluding other things we could have chosen. When you go to a restaurant, you'll see many choices on the menu. You rarely see, although I have seen it, a restaurant with only one menu item. And that was in Harrison, New York. It was a hot dog restaurant. You can have anything you wanted, as long as it's a hot dog. Remember, Henry Ford said you can have any color Ford you wanted, as long as it's black. Well, this hot dog store, uh, restaurant in Harrison, New York, had just that, hot dogs. But most of the time, you have many choices to make. And when you choose one thing, you necessarily reject another. Our scripture said, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. These Jewish Christians, to whom the letter to the Hebrews was written, were originally addressed during a time of suffering of great persecution and the loss of their valuables and their property because they identified with Christ and became a hated people. So he's saying to them, as he writes this letter, which are you going to choose? Are you going to be real Jews like Moses and choose to follow Christ? Moses faced the same thing, the writer says, because by faith he believed God and readily embraced the consequences. These verses today are about things Moses chose to embrace and things he chose to reject. So Moses will show us the most valuable choices to make in life. The most valuable choices to make in life. First, he chose to identify with the despised Hebrew slaves. He refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Thus he chose short-term pain, mistreatment along with the people of God. This was a choice for pain versus the pleasures of sin for a season. 
He chose identity with the people of God. He had another option. Pharaoh's house, as he was probably the next in line to be Pharaoh, since there seemed to be no male heir, no son born to Pharaoh. Now, you and I have seen the movie The Ten Commandments. It pits Charlton Heston against Yul Brenner, Charlton Heston being Moses, Yul Brenner being Pharaoh. Pharaoh's natural born son is who Yul Brenner had been. But that's not what the text of Scripture tells us. He chose the community of faith, Moses did, the community of faith who worshiped the Hebrew God. Remembering the story of Joseph in Genesis 43, verse 32, we read these words, Egyptians cannot eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to Egyptians. Now that's 400 years before Moses comes along. To be a Jew was to be an hated and expendable slave. Moses chose the path of suffering rather than the pleasures of sin for a short while. He refused to immerse himself in an immoral culture in which he could have any indulgence that his body or mind could imagine. So the question comes home to, to you and to me. If you knew that you wouldn't get caught satisfying your every desire, would you do it? What would you choose? Moses refused the pleasures of sin for a short while. He took the long view. First then, Moses chose to identify with the despised Hebrew slaves with the people of God, and that was his first choice. His second choice, he chose the disgrace of Christ, the disgrace associated with following Christ. This was a choice for shame versus the treasures of Egypt that lay at the feet of Pharaoh's household. He chose reproach and scorn, ridicule, because it was the only way to receive the joy of belonging to Christ. The hope of the coming deliverer, given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his father, was a focus on the coming of Christ. Abraham rejoiced to see the day of Christ, the Bible says. Now, what was his motivation? What motivates you to make the choices that you make? In verse 26, it says, He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. We're told that in our time, uh, deferred gratification is hardly in anyone's vocabulary. It used to be. Everybody wants everything right now and does not want to work for it or wait for it. All those who feel so privileged in this generation, particularly younger people who've never had to wait for anything, are choosing short term because they're being trained to do that. Moses was looking ahead, looking to the future for his reward. What I value most in life is what I choose. That is why the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 3, 1 through 3, Set your affections on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Not on earthly things. So in two verses, set your affections on things above where Christ is and set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Don't know if you've ever looked through a telescope before. But faith is like a telescope reaching into the future. A telescope narrows the focus of your eye. It blocks competing light and competing images, allowing you to focus on one object far away. In a way, it's sort of like macular degeneration. 
You can't see the peripheral anymore. You just see what the eye has to see dead set in front of it. And so faith is a telescope into the future. You see Christ at the right hand of God. You see faith, the way to receive him. And you trust in him alone for your salvation. Faith brings your focus on Christ. Moses was focused on the Christ. That text says so. He was focused on the Christ who was yet to come and to come with far greater rewards than Egypt ever offered. Moses chose to live for Christ's approval rather than the approval of any mortal. He wanted what Christ alone could give him, and so he made the choices that would lead him to Christ. What was Moses' final reward? Well, if you look at the scriptures, you see that he appears with Elijah to speak with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And the scripture says they spoke about the exodus of Jesus, which was soon to come. Moses certainly saw Christ by faith in his lifetime. And then the moment of his death, he saw Christ face to face. And here he is appearing in the Mount of, uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus about his coming departure. His exodus is what the word says. His exodus. To be approved of by Jesus is what he wanted. So that is what he got by faith. Philippians 3 verses 8 and following says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness that comes from keeping the law, the Ten Commandments, but that righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being like him in his death, and so, somehow, to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I want to please Christ. I want to know Christ, Paul writes, and so he does. Here are the things, then, that Moses chose that we should also choose. He chose to be part of the people of God, the Hebrew slaves in his day. Today. It is all those who confess Christ openly before men as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners. That is the church of Jesus Christ around the globe. We want to be part of that and we are willing to openly confess him before men in order to attain that. And then a second choice Moses made. That was to live for the approval of Christ rather than the approval of any man. The fear of the Lord and the love of Christ is the only thing that I know of that will make you fearless to confess Jesus before men and to live a godly life in a world that hates that because it convicts them. A silent witness we make when we make the choices for Jesus and who follows him. Every day I read in the news stories of people who despise the church, they despise religion. They talk about the abusive people within the church and yeah, 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 yeah. That's all true. But there is a true church too. There are all those who call in sincerity on the name of Jesus Christ. Those are our brothers and sisters. Hypocrites abound. Of course they do. You make sure that you're not one of those, that you are choosing to follow Christ to identify with believers in the church and those believers sometimes who don't go to church. But we go to church to be nurtured in the word of God, to sing the songs of Zion, to be reminded that we are sinners saved by grace alone. No reason for arrogance, none whatever, for God hates arrogance. But we are those who are saved, who ought to receive the just punishment of our sins, but don't. 
because Jesus stood in our place, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, the Bible says, rose again from the dead for our justification, declared not guilty at the judgment bar of God. We are those who identify with those people, and we'd rather have Christ's approval than man's. Moses chose to identify with the people of God and to live for Christ's approval. Every day you and I make choices of what to embrace in our lives and what to reject. We're making choices based on what we value the most. All of your choices are spiritual in nature. That is, they show what you value. If you have no eye for Christ and his reward that he can give us, then your values will necessarily be short-term and focused on maximizing pleasure. Avoiding pain at all costs. Avoiding shame at all costs. If you value hearing the voice of Christ say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then you will not be afraid of the short-term pain and shame that the unbelieving world will visit upon you for choosing to live for God's approval. What do you really want? Your choices tell what you really want. If God gives you the fruit of your choices, where will you be in the future? Let us pray. Our Father, none of us is worthy of your great love. We have all fallen many times. We have done what is evil in your sight many times. We thank you that you have not rewarded us according to our behavior, but according to the mercies of God in Jesus Christ. We thank you that before we were born, you loved us in Christ. You chose us. You gave us the Holy Spirit. And by that Spirit, we repent of the wickedness that we have done in this world. And we embrace him as our only hope of salvation. And he cannot fail us. Lord, be merciful to us and all who watch this broadcast. May Jesus alone be seen and glorified. In his name we ask it. Amen.